I'm also very excited about our next session where I will have the pleasure of introducing to you our 2022 O'Donnell Award recipients for their presentations. So I am Selda Gansel, I'm a member of NAE, and uh, as, as you heard from our chairman, this year I had the pleasure of being the chair of our Technology Innovation Awards Committee. So first of all, thank you all for attending this session. This is a very important part of our TEMES conference uh, where we recognize outstanding achievements by rising researchers in medicine, engineering, science, technology innovation. These awards play an important role in advancing TEMES goal of recognizing and promoting rising star researchers in the state. The awards are named in honor of the late Edith and Peter O'Donnell, who were steadfast supporters of TEMES since its inception and were among the state's staunchest advocates for excellence in higher education and research. The awards are supported through the O'Donnell Endowment, and you can see uh, our sponsors on the slide. So we'd like to acknowledge and thank the O'Donnell Endowment donors for their generous contributions to the endowment. So thank you. The award committee is composed of 12 TEMES members serving on four subcommittees. And again, you can see our committees and the membership on the slide. We have one committee for each award plus the committee chair. For the 2022 awards, there were a total of 68 nominations, 34 of which were renominations. Subcommittees select finalists to advance to the external review stage where National Academy's members outside of Texas review the finalist materials and submit comments. The Technology Innovation Subcommittee conducts their own site visits for the selected finalists. After a thorough review of the candidates, the awards committee recommends awards recipients to be submitted to the Nobel Laureates Committee. The Nobel Laureates Committee, chaired by Dr. Joseph Goldstein, reviews the recommended recipients and submits their endorsement to the TEMES Board of Directors for the final approval. We would like to thank the O'Donnell Award Committee and the Nobel Laureate Committee members who participated this year. Now, each of the medals has a distinct pattern reflective of the discipline. The awards are presented to the recipients at the annual O'Donnell Awards Dinner, which we will hold tonight, and we expect to see all of you there. I am now proud to present the 2022 O'Donnell Award recipients in order of their presentations. For the category of medicine, Dr. Jason McLellan, the University of Texas at Austin. For engineering, Dr. Jody Lutkenhaus, Texas A&M University. For science, Dr. Sarbajit Banarji, Texas A&M University. And for the technology innovation, Mr. Escher Spartush Schlumberger. Our first presentation this afternoon is from Dr. Jason McLellan. He is the Welch Chair in Chemistry and Professor in the Department of Molecular Biosciences at the University of Texas, Austin. He was chosen for his breakthrough research in mapping, modifying, and stabilizing coronavirus spike proteins, which laid the groundwork for vaccines from Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and Novavax. His team of structural biologists created the first three-dimensional structure of the coronavirus spike protein, a shape-shifting protein that allows the virus to enter and infect human cells. This blueprint of the protein enabled Dr. McLellan and his researchers to modify the spike and help stabilize it in a form that is optimal for use in vaccines. So Dr. McLellan, I'd like to invite you to the podium now. And after his presentation, uh, we will have about five minutes to ask him questions. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce you. All right, 
Okay, thank you very much. It's very exciting to be here. All right, let's see. All right, so I'll talk about uh, my lab and our uh, collaborators' work on structure function studies of SARS-CoV-2 spike and coronavirus spikes in general and the development of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, I am an inventor on licensed patents and patent applications related to this work, so I'll just keep that in mind. But as many of you know, the surface of coronaviruses is decorated with spike proteins. And these are some early images from the 1960s of what uh, human coronaviruses looked like. They had these uh, projections. This letter to nature, 1968, the authors noted that the particles are more or less rounded in profile, but they have this characteristic fringe of projections. Uh, and this appearance recalls the solar corona, which has its own projections. And so they put forth the name coronavirus for this family of, of viruses. We started working on coronaviruses in 2013 with my collaborator, Dr. Barney Graham. Uh, this was around the time that the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus emerged in Saudi Arabia and the surrounding region. And we thought, well, we had SARS in 2002, MERS in 2012. Uh, this is not going to be the last coronavirus to spill over into the human population, so let's start working on these and figure out how best to make vaccines for a future pandemic, maybe 10 years later. Uh, and so conceptually, the idea was pretty straightforward. We needed to figure out what a, a spike protein looked like at high resolution, right? Atomic level uh, structural information. Then once we had that, we could perform protein engineering to try to make modifications, stabilizations, to make the, the spike protein uh, the best possible antigen for a vaccine, and then test and figure out different uh, delivery platforms, mRNA, protein, and others. All right. So in 2013, and even as late as 2015, uh, most of the information on coronavirus spike proteins, uh, the structural information was relatively low resolution for the full spike. There were some structures of individual components. Uh, so we knew that the S1 subunit of spike contained two domains that we call the N-terminal domain and the receptor binding domain. Uh, S2, which contains all the fusion machinery, this shape-shifting part of the molecule. We only had structures of this final state, this post-fusion state. Um, and so that, that was not particularly helpful for, for vaccine design. And, and then for full spikes, we just had very low resolution uh, EM studies. So we had to improve upon that. So we started working on the MERS coronavirus spike, which was circulating in, in the Middle East, uh, but we had a very difficult time expressing the full spike from MERS. Uh, and so the, the red columns in the SDS page gel, there's no band, right? So we just could not make uh, any of it. We could make some of the smaller domains, NTD and S1, but just could not make full spike. Uh, fortunately, Barney happened to be working on another coronavirus, human coronavirus, HKU1. Uh, this is a cause of, uh, one of the causes of the common cold. And the spike protein from HKU1 actually behaved really well. We could make it. Uh, it stayed together. Uh, we sent it to Andrew Ward's lab at the Scripps Research Institute for negative stain EM, and they looked like trimeric molecules like we were expecting. Uh, and so working collaboratively, Andrew's lab was able to solve uh, a four angstrom structure of the HKU1 spike in its pre-fusion confirmation uh, by cryo-EM. And this was really exciting. We could see the, the S1 subunit in blue, the S2 subunit in pink, the two other copies in the trimer are in white and gray. Uh, it revealed where the, the N-terminal domain is located on the periphery of the molecule. The receptor binding domain mediates the trimerization interaction. Uh, the structure revealed some new subdomains in yellow that we called subdomain one and subdomain two. These were not appreciated until uh, we, we were able to solve this structure. And then importantly, we were able to determine the structure of the S2 subunit, which is this highly coiled, spring-loaded like uh, subunit that it facilitates the membrane fusion event. So since that time, my lab, Andrew's lab, David Beesler's lab, and others have determined a lot of cryo-EM structures. So we have a good understanding of how the spike molecule worked. It exists in the initial prefusion confirmation. A receptor binding domain opens up, binds receptors such as ACE2, induces shedding of S1. Then you get rearrangement of S2 into this harpoon-like pre-hairpin intermediate. And then the pre-hairpin intermediate collapses into this highly stable post-fusion confirmation that brings the virus in together with the cell membrane. 
And this allows the fusion pore to form, and now the contents of the virus can enter the cell. So these are really amazing uh, little macromolecular machines that facilitate the fusion of the viral membrane with the host cell membrane. And so when you see something like this, this molecule that can be processed and shed and undergo conformational change, when you're making a vaccine, you have to decide which of these forms do we want and how do we stabilize it in that form. So our goal was to stabilize the S2 subunit and prevent conversion to the post-fusion conformation. Uh, we had previously done work with Barney on respiratory syncytial virus, which is in the, the lower right-hand corner. And so that has a pre-fusion and post-fusion conformation. It's actually very similar to the S2 subunits pre-fusion and post-fusion conformation. Uh, they both have this central helix in blue that does not undergo a conformational change between pre-fusion and post-fusion. And then these other elements of the first heptad repeat in green, yellow, orange, red, all of that flips around 180 degrees and polymerizes the long alpha helix in the post-fusion state. So for protein design, we had to come up with a method of engineering mutations to prevent that transition from occurring. Uh, so my postdoc, Nian Chuang Long, uh, he tried a number of different stabilization methods like introducing cysteines to form disulfide bonds, introducing hydrophobic residues to pack cavities, and one that worked really well was the substitution of residues for proline. And there's this one region in the spike between the central helix in blue and the first region of the heptad repeat in green. This needs to pivot 180 degrees and then polymerize. And so Nianchuang started replacing these amino acids with proline, which is what the most rigid of the amino acids. Uh, and that was based on some ideas from Hans Langedijk and others for RSV. And what we can see just looking at the protein expression the wild type MERS spike, we could make a very small amount, a very faint band, but just one amino acid change to proline resulted in a huge boost in expression. And changing both of these amino acids to proline gave about a 50 fold increase in the amount of protein that could be produced. And even better is that the molecule was much more stable and was more or less locked in the prefusion confirmation. So we could send the protein to our collaborator, Andrew Ward. Uh, they showed that when they analyzed the wild type spike protein, they saw a mixture of post-fusion spikes and pre-fusion spikes. And over time, the pre-fusion spikes would convert to the post-fusion. Uh, but the two proline form just remained locked in the pre-fusion confirmation. And we sent this to Barney's lab and Kazmekia Corbett in his lab. Uh, immunized mice, and then looked at the neutralizing antibody responses elicited by these immunogens. Uh, and so higher is better. And so they tested the two proline spike in red, the wild type spike in blue, or just the S1 subunit in orange. I mean, you can see it's against all these different MERS coronavirus or pseudoviruses, immunizing with the two proline stabilized form in red, elicited about tenfold higher neutralizing antibody titers than did wild type spike. And even better is that this region uh, where we put the stabilizing substitutions is highly conserved among all the different beta coronaviruses. So the coronaviruses are a very diverse family of viruses. Uh, we've been primarily concerned with the beta coronaviruses, which include two of the human coronaviruses that cause the common cold, as well as MERS, SARS, and SARS-2. And so just from a sequence alignment, we would know right where to put the two prolines, and that worked very well for SARS from 2002. Wild type SARS was a mixture of pre-fusion and post-fusion. Two proline SARS uh, was just all pre-fusion. It even worked for HK1, which was already pretty stable, but the two prolines boosted expression about threefold. And so we had all of this work done and published back in 2017 as sort of a universal method of stabilizing beta coronavirus spikes for their use in vaccines. So in late 2019, early 2020, when we were following news uh, on Twitter that there were uh, pneumonia clusters of unknown origin in China, uh, we were concerned that maybe it was uh, either an influenza virus or coronavirus. Uh, on January 6, uh, Barney called me, sort of confirmed talking with people in China that it was a beta coronavirus similar to SARS. Uh, so on January 10th, Chinese researchers, Yang Zhengzhang, published the SARS-CoV-2 sequence online, and then immediately we got to work. Uh, within 10 days, Nian Chuang had cloned, uh, I think, nine different plasmids of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein with the stabilizing mutations. 
10 days later, on January 30th, Daniel Rapp, a grad student in my lab, had purified the spike protein, started cryo-EM data collection, and by February 10th, we had a manuscript submitted to Science and BioArchive describing the first structure of the SARS-CoV-2 spike, stabilized in its prefusion confirmation. So one month from a novel coronavirus genome being posted online to a high-resolution cryo-EM structure. The SARS-CoV-2 spike protein that we worked with the structural studies uh, contained the proline substitutions at positions 986 and 987. That's right at this apex of the central helix in the first hep head repeat. Uh, it did not express as well as what we had seen from MERS and SARS. We were only getting about half a milligram per liter of cell culture, but it was sufficient for the cryo-EM studies. Uh, so this is the structure. For all the particles, we essentially saw one confirmation where one of the receptor binding domains, which is the one in green, is in the up confirmation. That's the confirmation that's accessible to bind ACE2. And then our model is that once that one flips up, binds ACE2, the second and third, then ratchet up, can bind neighboring molecules. At that point, uh, S1 sheds, falls off, and S2 rearranges to start the fusion. Uh, so this was really rapid, published quickly in science. We were trending on Reddit for a while, which is pretty exciting to open up your phone and see your own structure on it. Uh, the paper's been cited 7,000 times, which goes to show you how much science has been done in a couple of years on coronavirus. Uh, what we're really excited about is that uh, more than four uh, of the leading COVID-19 vaccines all use the prefusion stabilized spike protein in the vaccine. So you can see the Moderna mRNA 1273 contains the two proline mutations at positions 986 and 987, as does the Pfizer and BioNTech BNT162B2 or community. They have the same two. Johnson & Johnson worked with Dan Baruch in their Ad26 platform. They tested seven different spike protein variants and, uh, in non-human primates and determined that the two proline form was the best, and so they moved that forward. And then Novavax, which we're still waiting for the, the EUA, they also used the two proline mutations. So pretty exciting to see something that we had worked on prior to the pandemic uh, actually get used in many of these highly successful vaccines. Uh, we weren't finished, though. As I mentioned, we were, we were a little unhappy that the protein did not express as well. We ended up shipping the plasmid to make that protein to over 100 different labs around the world. And we started getting feedback that labs had trouble making enough of it for diagnostics, serological assays, uh, their own vaccine development. So Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation reached out to see if we could make a second generation spike that was even more stable, better behaved. Um, and so this was uh, March, April 2020. Most of the labs at UT were shutting down that weren't working on coronavirus. So some of my colleagues, Ilya Finkelstein, Jennifer Maynard, they reached out and said, we have a lot of talented grad students and postdocs. There's something we can do to help. And I thought, yeah, let's try to do this effort. We now had the, the structure of SARS-CoV-2 spike. So we could perform a second round of structure-based vaccine design, which was led by my postdoc, Ching Lin Shea and Jory Goldsmith. So we designed 100 different substitutions for the SARS-CoV-2 spike. And these included, oops, these included uh, introduction of additional prolines, introduction of charge residues to form salt bridges, cavity filling substitutions, and introduction of disulfide bonds. And so every grad student postdoc grabbed five or 10 of the different designs, cloned them, expressed, purified, and characterized. Uh, so we did, we did 100 total. Uh, this shows the expression levels. Uh, the two proline form is our base. Uh, all the substitutions were introduced on top of that. So again, here we're getting about one microgram per mil expression. Just some individual substitutions, a like glycine to glutamate, which introduced, uh, it allowed a salt bridge to form, gave about a six-fold increase in protein expression, as did one of the prolines. Several of the prolines worked really well. So we had about 24 top substitutions that had a beneficial impact on either stability or protein expression. Uh, we started combining these, and the combination of prolines worked really well. Uh, so we really like Combo 47, which contained four additional prolines, so six total. We were able to increase the melting temperature by five degrees to about 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, by size exclusion chromatography, the peak, the area under the curve, was about tenfold higher than the two proline form. And by negative stain EM, it was just a homogeneous population of prefusion spikes. And so we really like this one. Uh, it had six prolines, so we called it hexapro. Uh, we could scale this up. We were making, we went from 0.5 mg per liter at large scale to 11 mg per liter. In a different cell line, we were able to hit 32 milligrams per liter. We solved the cryo-EM structure. 
to show that there's essentially no difference between hexapro in green and the two proline spike in white. Uh, the introduction of the prolines had no impact. Uh, this has been a very popular protein uh, in plasmid. AdGene has distributed it now to more than 178 different labs around the world for antibody isolation, diagnostics, and vaccine development. Uh, we sent hexapro and the two proline spikes to Barney's lab. They immunized mice uh, three weeks apart with a terminal bleed three weeks later. And uh, then uh, Drew Blood analyzed for neutralizing antibody titers, so higher is better. And what you can see is that at each of the three doses tested, 10 microgram, 2 microgram, and 0.4 microgram, Hexapro elicited higher neutralizing antibody titers than did the two proline form. And it's particularly noticeable in the red, which is the lowest dose, the 0.4 microgram dose. There, the two proline spike elicited a pretty modest uh, antibody response, whereas Hexapro listed a really robust response that didn't even have much of a, a dose curve compared to the 2 microgram and 10 micrograms. So we think it's a fantastic subunit-based vaccine antigen. Uh, it's now been incorporated into multiple different vaccines in various stages of development. One of the ones that's farthest along is this vaccine platform based on Newcastle disease virus. This is a platform created at Mount Sinai by Peter Polisi, Wayne Sun, Florian Kramer, and others. Uh, so Newcastle disease virus is an avian paramyxovirus, uh, does not cause disease in humans, but it grows well in eggs, which is a benefit because a lot of the developing world makes their yearly influenza vaccines in eggs. And so what they did was they inserted the hexapro gene, shown in green, uh, in between the matrix protein gene and the phosphoprotein gene. And so you can make, take this recombinant virus, inject it into eggs, and it grows to really high titers. And what emerges is a Newcastle disease variant that's covered in hexapro. And that virus can then be inactivated or not and injected into humans. And the data look uh, really exciting so far. So several different countries are, have been moving this forward, including Thailand, Vietnam, Brazil, Mexico. Uh, this is uh, some images from GPO in Thailand. They have a state-of-the-art facility for making their yearly flu vaccine, and they can just pivot now and start making their own SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Uh, they call it HXP GPOVAC for Hexapro GPOVAC. Uh, it's through phase two clinical trials and enrolling now in phase three. Uh, you can see even at the three microgram dose in green, we're getting about tenfold higher neutralizing antibody responses than uh, the antibody levels found in human convalescent sera. Uh, in some of the phase twos, we've now shown superiority over the AstraZeneca vaccine, and the antibody elicitation titers are similar to that from Pfizer. Uh, and this can be made in country at a fraction of the cost. Uh, another platform we're really excited about is one developed by an Australian company called Vaxis. Uh, so they've developed a patch-based vaccine. Uh, so it's about a, well, it was a one centimeter by one centimeter patch that contains about 5,000 little micro projections. Uh, and it gives you an epidermal delivery of the vaccine. You can see the amount you can coat these projections with uh, Hexapro or Hexapro plus QS21 adjuvant. This is pre-delivery. After delivery, you can see from the tip down to the white arrow the amount of protein that's been deposited. So you just get this little uh, site. The benefits are that you don't need skilled healthcare workers dealing with uh, needles and syringes to deliver it. The patch is stable at room temperature for months. They've created this delivery apparatus, it's like a little mini tuna can with a spring, and you can just put it on your arm and push it, and it delivers the vaccine. So the idea is that you'd be able to just ship sleeves of these to low and middle income countries without needing cold chain, uh, and they'd be able to self-apply if necessary. And so this is starting phase one clinical trials uh, later this year. Uh, but we think it's a really exciting platform. The animal data looks good, and I think it's kind of a, a cool use. It might even be helpful in the U.S. and developed countries where some of the vaccine hesitancy is actually just due to fear of needles. Uh, and so it could be popular with kids even. All right, so to summarize, I hope we've been able to show how prior research on coronavirus spikes allowed for the structure-based design of two stabilizing proline substitutions. Uh, these are now found in uh, at least four, but it's more like five or six that I know of, uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Hexapro, which contains an additional four prolines, is substantially improved and is in various stages of preclinical and clinical development, including the NDV platform. Uh, and I think right now it's just a really exciting time with uh, 
CryoEM, high resolution structures, structure based design, machine learning advances, and protein folding and protein design. I think it's really leading us into a golden era of vaccinology. And so I've tried to highlight all of our collaborators that have talked about this. Uh, this work is uh, extremely collaborative. And just want to, yeah, thank all of our funders. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take a question or two. Thank you very much, Dr. McLeodon, for an excellent presentation and also your research enabling effective, affordable, and maybe easier to apply vaccines. It's great. So we have a few minutes for questions. If anyone would like to ask questions or, or comments. Uh, <coughs> beautiful presentation. I'm Roderick Pettigrew from Texas A&M. Um, what you just showed is an exemplar of how meeting grand challenges, particularly now, uh, and developing the innovation that is successful in meeting those challenges is really a team sport. Uh, you did a beautiful job in weaving together many of the developments and many of the names that we've seen and read about uh, in this triumphant effort to quickly uh, realize an effective vaccine. And the fact uh, uh, that uh, the point was made earlier today that this builds on years, actually decades, decades. of preliminary work uh, started by uh, Katie Carrico you know, some decades ago, who first demonstrated you could in fact take mRNA and instruct a cell to make a target protein. And now your work, in combination with the colleagues that you cited and, and wove into this presentation, Barney Graham and his um, protege, Kismikia Corbett, uh, the three of you, you know, working together and weaving that. Now we understand how that happens to stabilize the protein. And you reference also then a delivery vehicle which was where the engineering also came in to have uh, an ionizable uh, lipid nanoparticle to deliver it. But all of that shows beautifully how uh, effective innovation really is a team sport. Yeah. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, just, just a comment. I mean, mRNA was discovered in 1961. Uh, coronaviruses were first discovered in 1931 in, in chickens. Uh, so you've had just decades of research on N mRNA, mRNA delivery, uh, modification of nucleoside bases, all the lipid and lipid compositions, and then not to mention just the tens of thousands of people in volunteer trials, people involved in, in shipping, packaging. It's, they're really a triumph of just thousands and tens of thousands of, of people, uh, each playing different roles in the vaccine development. And to that point, the, the question was raised earlier today about the public being frightened because they were told it just happened overnight. It didn't happen overnight. No. Your point. Yeah. And you just illustrated. Yeah, it's unfortunate that the, the public just doesn't hear more about science on a daily basis. There, there was mRNA trials for cancer in 2008. Uh, so we've had 10 plus years of mRNA uh, phase one clinical data in humans. We know it's safe, but the public doesn't hear about that. So this challenge was a stimulus to bring all of this um, activity together and focus it on developing a practical solution, which is what you know the theme of this conference is about. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was a hard comment to follow, really. <laughs> <laughs> Very well put. Uh, great talk, thank you. And uh, I guess I wanted to ask sort of what's next, and particularly with regard to uh, uh, let's say um, nasopharyngeal delivery yep. and, uh, and variants and whether your research uh, impinges on those questions. Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. I think uh, technologically they're, they're readily addressable, right? So the, the mRNA vaccines can easily pivot and they can make Omicron mRNA and Moderna's, they've actually made it for beta, delta. It's just sort of pulling the trigger knowing when to release that. And some of that's more just regulatory with the FDA. When do you want to now start having multiple vaccines on the market? One encoding just the original Wuhan, one Wuhan Omicron. But technologically, it's, it's trivial to do. And so it, it's, it's really more with the regulars. What we see is that boosting, particularly the third dose, really gives you expansive antibody breadth. 
Um, and so you really don't need an Omicron specific one yet, but at some point you will. I think likely what we're gonna see is development of uh, more pan respiratory based vaccines. So Moderna, for instance, tested one vaccine that contains six mRNAs, four against influenza hemagglutinins, one against respiratory syncytial virus F, and one against coronavirus spike. So maybe a single shot you get in the fall that broadly protects you against that winter's respiratory pathogens. Something that could be updated then as you update the flu mRNAs, you'd update the coronavirus spike. Um, mucosal delivery is really interesting. A lot of people working on that. These vaccines, obviously given intramuscularly, their goal is to protect the lower respiratory tract, prevent severe disease and hospitalization. They don't do so well protecting the upper respiratory tract. We know that. It's also not so bad to get boosted by a natural infection in the upper respiratory tract. Concern with the mucosal is you might be able to boost the intranasal titers, but are you then going to provide sufficient protection uh, for the lower? But I think a lot of studies tested. Even the Newcastle disease virus platform is being tested in Mexico as, an, uh, as a live, uh, so you'd actually be able to get some round of infection in the upper respiratory tract. So I think it's an exciting area. I think it's all, yeah. And then there's pan coronavirus and things like that. So lots to do. I think technologically all like pretty straightforward. Thank you. I will ask you questions more privately since we are colleagues, but I have a specific public question. On February 10th or February 5th of 2020, it appears that you knew already about SARS and MERS and you had worked on it and so on. Did the medical community know the same things? And why didn't they come earlier to say protect yourselves? I'm asking you for a specific question. I visited Saudi Arabia at the beginning of February. I came back and within three days, I had very serious symptoms of what we call now COVID, but it was not COVID, it was MERS. What did the medical community do at that time? Were they ready for what was coming up or not? That's a great question. I'd first like to start off by asking if we could draw your blood because it is very hard to get MERS uh, blood samples. So. I'll be glad to give okay. you some. I'll be glad to give you some. All right, <laughs> so I will, I will connect with you afterward. Uh, no, I don't think anybody was really prepared for this. Uh, I mean, you saw just with like PPE shortages and other things, uh, hospitals, healthcare workers being completely overwhelmed. I'm not sure if being more aware of MERS and SARS would have helped. They're all very different diseases. MERS does not spread easily person to person, but does kill 35% of infected people. So they're all really, yeah, um, so congrats. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're all quite different, but uh, I think we've probably learned, we'll be much better prepared for the next pandemic, and there will be one. Thanks. One last question, and this might be uh, something for, for afterwards. Uh, you did make allusion to the, the fear and cleavage sequence. Yep. Um, as an alternative entry pathway, how did that affect your thinking about your, your strategy? Mm -hmm. And also, what's your opinion about the origin of the fear and cleavage sequence? Yeah, so uh, let's so see. So the, the fear and cleavage site, it's, uh, it's between S1 and S2. SARS does not have a fear and cleavage site. It gets cleaved by temperance 2 there. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 has four amino acids that are inserted relative to SARS. Some people have called this a smoking gun or signs of like engineering. Uh, it didn't really affect our strategy uh, very much. I would prefer that the furin cleavage site be mutated uh, so as to not allow cleavage for the vaccine antigen. Moderna and Pfizer uh, kept wild type. J&J um, &J and Novavax mutated it. Uh, so, so that's one thing. In terms of origin, uh, we'll never know. I think all the data points strongly to a natural zoonosis. Uh, this is the seventh human coronaviruses. The previous six have all spilled over from bats into animals into humans. So there's no reason to think that this one is any different. Could it have perhaps passed through a lab uh, on its way into the human population? Possibly. Uh, but there's just no evidence at all for engineering. And I don't even think we have the capability to know how to engineer something like this. Uh, in cell culture, if you grow SARS-CoV-2, it just spits out the furin cleavage site. It's, it's actually only beneficial in, in humans. Uh, in cell culture, it, it spits it out. Thank you. 